Those who are visiting with us, grateful you're here and uh, happy to have this occasion to study together. We have uh, for some time been looking at the subject of what the Bible teaches about elders in the local church, leaders in the local church, and uh, this morning we finished, I might say finally, <laughs> with the, uh, not only the office but the qualities necessary for that office, but there's still one passage that we've not uh, dealt with, one text that we're familiar with, but that we've not dealt with so much in this, this particular series, and I wanted tonight to spend a few minutes thinking with you about 1 Peter 5. You're welcome to turn there. We're going to be reading. We have on the chart the old King James translation of 1 Peter 5. <clears throat> I'm not sure we're going to say anything that you hadn't heard before, but we will try to emphasize some very fundamental important truths uh, from this passage about this office and this work. 1 Peter 5 <clears throat> begins this way. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, and neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. What a great thought. In the first place, we note the fact that this is one of the passages that helps us understand that uh, terms like presbyteros and poimen and uh, episcopus are all related to the same office. They are all used in reference to the same work. And so whether you're talking about elders or you're talking about shepherd or pastor, whether you're talking about an overseer, those are different terms, but they're different terms that go back to the same office. They're used in that sense interchangeably. That's true in Acts 20, and it's true, I think, here. And therefore, the effort to try to say, well, a pastor is different than an overseer or that an overseer somehow is different than the elders is just not scriptural. And that point has been made many times, but we can't emphasize that too much because the world uh, will teach the opposite on a regular basis. Something else that we notice from this passage <clears throat> is in the beginning, Peter writes to the elders, and he calls himself here a fellow elder. That's the way the uh, American Standard Version translates it. The elders I exhort who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. If you're like me, that really is a striking statement. You know, Peter was a lot of things. He was an apostle of the Lord. He was one of the most famous Christians that ever lived. One of the 12 that Jesus originally chose, uh, certainly a big uh, fixture in the story and the gospels and in the first part of the book of Acts, he was uh, a man inspired to write uh, two letters that were contained in the 30, uh, the 27 books of the New Testament. But I'll tell you what he was in reference to this group. He was a fellow elder. And that is striking to me. Uh, because in, in the way that men think about things, we uh, have all kinds of hierarchies of elders. and uh, We got big elders and little elders and elders in between and all kind of offices. and But you know, he writes to the brethren there in Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia, Bithynia, and, and the elders that were there in those congregations in those areas, and he said, we're all on the same level here as shepherds. Now, now that's a remarkable thought. Uh, and, and I think that, that, you know, it reminds me of this fact. There's just no place on earth for a chief elder not within the presbytery of, of, of a congregation. You know, history tells us, we've talked about this in earlier lessons, and you've heard it through the years, that things began to get off track whenever those who identified themselves as Christians began to think of the local leadership in terms of a group of elders and then one that was just a st step above the rest. Maybe we'll call him the bishop among the elders. 
And then when you think about congregations where uh, maybe the work in general, where um, <clears throat> you have big cities where these big elders are ruling, and they, they count a little bit more than some of the other elders, you know. And they, the churches there are more important. We got all kinds of differences that men have made. But within the presbytery of a local church, you have fellow elders. That's all you have. In a region, you just have elders over local churches. On the whole earth, you have nothing higher than a local church with its elders. That's all. There's no organization higher than that. And I think that point, lost on the world, uh, is made plainly by this simple statement. If Peter didn't qualify as a super elder, nobody else ever will. He certainly didn't claim to be such. And I make this point in passing, that I think this passage is one of those that makes it clear that uh, a man who preaches or teaches may also serve. Uh, if otherwise qualified, of course, as an elder, uh, one of the shepherds of a local church. Uh, there may be special issues to consider there. Uh, not everybody thinks so. <laughs> I I've asked a lot of folks through the years uh, about this very point, and you may have a lot more wisdom than I do about it, but I was looking for wisdom. And I've asked some older, wiser fellows, I said, what do you think about a... a preacher serving as an elder in a local church. And some of them just dismiss the question as foolish. Well, of course, 1 Peter 5 is scriptural, and that is absolutely true. It is scriptural, I believe. It is possible. Are there any other considerations? I think there's some who give more pause. And I guess I've been in that category through the years. Not that I ever doubted it was unscriptural, or that it was scriptural, I should say. I believe it is scriptural. But, you know, other questions that might be a factor here, or issues that may be a factor here. Um, is there a danger that uh, because the man who's preaching or teaching might be so visible that he might tend to, to dominate the eldership, uh, that people might look to him as some sort of fellow above the rest? That'd be a disaster. Uh, well, if he's wise enough to recognize that danger, he can work to avoid it. That is true. But it is something he's going to, I think, have to do in many cases. Uh, I had one fellow tell me one time he didn't think it was a great idea to be your own boss. Uh, <laughs> well, that was rather a flippant way to say it. Uh, I think the elders have their work, and I think the work of preaching is not exactly the same. Elders oversee the congregation, that is true. Uh, and I, I think they certainly will have a say in terms of the men who preach at a particular place. Um, but uh, be that as it may, you know, is it not possible that a man could serve in that capacity? I think certainly he could. Uh, and uh, I don't think that he would have to be so insensitive as not to recognize that his limitations, if his work had come to an end, that he would have the grace to step aside. But it would add another layer because now he's also an elder and maybe his presence there would merit whether there's an eldership or not. There are questions that come about that have to be dealt with and thought about and answered, but there's no question in my mind that a, a man who serves as a preacher of the gospel may also, if otherwise qualified, serve as an elder. And, uh, and I think in many cases it's been done successfully. I've known a few where it's not worked out very well, but I think that was a, maybe a question of character more than uh, anything else. At any rate, Peter, I think, makes it plain that a man may serve as an elder, I'm sorry, as a, as a preacher, a teacher, an apostle, even in that case, and also be a fellow elder. I'll tell you something else about Peter being uh, here noted as a fellow elder. I think it also deals with the question or the point that the word blameless, as we've looked at it in the qualifications, must not mean flawless. Uh, never made a mistake, or never made a mistake anybody noticed. <laughs> because obviously the Apostle Peter uh, made such mistakes. God chose Peter for the work of an apostle and an elder despite his past denial of Jesus. And despite the fact that even as an apostle, 
that on one occasion and uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul had to call him down at Antioch because he was to be blamed, or as one translation said, he stood condemned. And he was dressed down pretty well, and rightly so. Galatians 2 and verse 11. The Apostle Paul was chosen not for the work of an elder, but the work of an apostle, despite the fact that in time past he had been guilty of persecuting Christians. And uh, Moses was chosen as a leader in Israel, despite the fact that he was uh, responsible for the murdering of a Egyptian taskmaster. However you want to classify that, he did take that line. So I guess the point that we are here reinforcing is that there is a place for repentance, and there's a place for forgiveness, and there's a place for the grace of God, and there's a place for old wounds that ought to be healed. And because a man has... Uh, done wrong does not mean that he is thus forever excluded from any kind of public service to the Lord, including that of a shepherd. His present conduct ought to be above reproach, and I think that point is made plain by the qualities necessary. You know, I can't help but read, if you'll bear with me here a minute, over in John, the, the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter. <clears throat> this is such a, a moving passage, isn't it? In John 21... Um, Jesus is going to appear to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And the setting, not all the disciples on this occasion, but Simon, Peter, and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. And Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say, we also go with you. Uh, you know, people have debated what's going on here and what Peter meant when he said that. And uh, was he going back into the fishing business? Were they all going back in the fishing business? Uh, or was Peter just saying, well, I, I'm hungry. I need to catch something for lunch. Um, at any rate, Peter certainly, I, I think, has his mind more on the Sea of Galilee than he does right now on the world that Jesus called him to save. But anyway, um, they go into the ship, they fish at night, they catch nothing. Verse 4 says, and when the morning was now come, Jesus was on the shore. They didn't recognize him. This is, of course, after his death and resurrection. And uh, the Lord could, even in his corporeal form, hide his uh, identity from some, and he did that on this occasion. And he called out to them, and he said, Children, do you have any meat? And they said, No. And he said, Well, you uh, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you'll find. Well, uh, they thought to themselves, I'm sure, as uh, Peter had on a couple of other occasions, uh, this is not the place of the time to be catching fish. We've been where the fish ought to be at the time they ought to be, and they weren't there. In fact, I suspect that the very suggestion either would have spurred Peter to think to himself, this guy knows nothing about the fishing business, or it would have been a hauntingly familiar request. So they did what the man told them. They cast their net, and they were not able to draw the nets back for the number of fish that were there. And therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, by that point he knew, he said, it's the Lord. And Peter heard that, and he jumps into the sea, begins to make his way apparently to the shore. And the other disciples, they uh, came in a little ship, they weren't far from the land, and they were dragging the nets with them. And by the time they got there, there was already a fire ready. And fish lay there on and bread, Bring them the fish that you've caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net uh, to the land of, uh, full of great fish. He specifies 153, so many that the nets began to break. And Jesus said, come and dine. And nobody had to ask who this was. By this point, they know this is the Lord. 
And Jesus comes and he takes the bread and he gives it to them and the fish likewise. The third time that Jesus appeared to them. When they died, verse 15, I notice. Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? One of those questions again. What's he mean by more than these? Does he mean more than these fish? Was Peter tempted to go back to the fishing business? Or did he mean more than these? You know, Peter had said rather boldly, hadn't he? Not that long before. Oh, all these fellows, they may let you down. Not me. I'll never do it. Well, Peter answered and said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And much has been made about the point that there are two different words for love used here. And I think that's not unreasonable to notice that. That uh, Jesus said, do you love me? Using the word agape. And Peter says, I love you. Using the word phileo. And some have suggested that it might be translated something along this line. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I'm your friend. He said, well then feed my lambs. Get busy. And again he saith to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Do you love me? And Peter said again, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. And he said, feed my sheep. And the third time, anything significant about that, you suppose? <laughs> three times, he asked him, three times. He said, Peter, this time the Lord changed the word. He said, are you my friend? Are you my friend? And I must have cut him. He said, Lord, you, you know all things. You know that I'm your friend. He said, then feed my sheep. And then he told him he was going to die for the cost. He didn't, it won't be easy. It'll cost you. I'm calling you anyway. I'm saying it's your job. It's your duty. Get back to work. Feed my sheep. After what he had done, there was still plenty of work for him to do because Peter had changed and God's grace is real. So I just make the point. I, I don't know if I made this up or I heard somebody say it. Probably somebody said it and I've forgotten who. Don't let the devil rob you twice. You may have heard that expression. I've heard coaches in sports, you know, they talk about <clears throat> how if, if a team is not careful, they'll lose a game they weren't supposed to lose, and they'll let that same game last week beat them again the next week. You've heard that. And I think in a much more important realm, the idea here is don't let, you know, the devil had robbed Peter. That, that could have been the greatest moment of Peter's life. When they said to him, as he had uh, fled the garden, as they all did, and they came to Peter and they said, you're one of his disciples, and he could have stood up and said, yes, I am. And I ought to be standing right beside him, and I don't care who knows it. I, he didn't say that. The devil robbed him. But don't let him rob you again by letting that failure cause a failure today and a failure tomorrow and a failure that's a good lesson for all of us anytime. Don't let yesterday's failure rob you again and again. If you see you did wrong, do right now. Ask God to forgive you and move on in his grace. Um, I'll tell you something else that's obvious, but it's worth saying. Not only do we not select flawless men, but it's certainly likely that men who are appointed are not going to be flawless either as elders. Doesn't mean they're above question or that we ought to ignore sin. That's not what I'm talking about. But recognize the fact that people will sometimes fail, even those in such an important position. That's true about uh, parents. I remember uh, years ago when our children were little, I had a fellow that I appreciated very much, and I'd ask him parent questions, you know. And I've, I've told some of you this before, I know. But I asked him one time, I said, you know, I'm supposed to be sort of, a, of an authority figure in their lives. And, and you know, if I, if I mess up or do the wrong thing, should I apologize to my kids? Is that going to undercut my authority? Because I realized now what a stupid question that was. But I, at the time, I was sincere. I thought, and he said, he said, well, he said, you might as well admit it. They're going to know it anyway. Good point. No, I don't think it makes you smaller when you mess up and you say, I messed up. I think that's all a man, honest man can do. 
I think that's true about elders. And if they're too proud to back up when they're going the wrong way, then they should never have been there to start with. And that's some of those qualifications that we've talked about earlier, pride and temper. But anyway, you know, man ought to be forgiven. And not be held against him if he continues to do, if he does what's right with a true heart. It's true about spouses. I remember a, a fellow, he wasn't even a Christian, but he made a point one time. He had been married, you know, I don't know, 60 years, something like that, a long time. <clears throat> and somebody asked him about his success as a husband and his long marriage. And he said something rather simple, but again, rather profound. He said, you know, one thing that's really helped my wife and I is that when we got married, neither of us thought the other was perfect. <laughs> Everybody in this thing knew nobody's perfect here. And he said, yeah, that sort of helped us to get through some situations. There's a lot of truth in that. So, you know, men, we're not just appointing flawless men. We're appointing men who've made mistakes, but their heart's in the right place, and they've got the humility when they do wrong to do right. And the same will be true in their services they go forward. Let me go back to the text. 1 Peter 5. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Well, it's an important point, isn't it? Um, when I grew up, there were still religious debates going on. And, and one of the things that among brethren, they, they still are some, but, uh, you know, brethren would debate differences among themselves. And some of the things that, that I can remember hearing about as a young Christian were issues that were not new. They were 100, 150 years old when I first heard about them. And they just seemed to come up periodically. Uh, a lot of the differences that have divided brethren revolve around the same kind of issue, just different faces and different places and different names. But one thing that you just about count on is that people are not satisfied with God's simple arrangement of local churches. Now that's a fact. Men love bureaucracy. They love, just look at government. Look at what a mess it is. Men love the idea of big projects and chief seats and big titles and power and how many people are going to jump when I holler. And we might tell ourselves, we're just doing so much good here. But really what we're doing is changing God's plan to suit our vanity. And one of the examples of that over the last hundred years or so is the sponsoring church arrangement. This is a rather poor quality copy of a debate chart uh, from discussions that were held over something called the Herald of Truth. Again, when I was a young person, I could remember the Herald of Truth on television here in Birmingham, sponsored by or helped by one of the local churches here. What churches would do is they would send their money to uh, a church out in Abilene, Texas, and then that church, at that time at least, had oversight of this work. <coughs> it's not enough for a church in Birmingham to provide its own teaching or a church over here in Texas to provide their own teaching. What we're going to do is we're going to gather money from all these different churches and send to this church, and this central church will then do big things with money. And that's what happened. So we're going to put on this nationwide radio broadcast slash television broadcast slash whatever. And we're going to have a church that's going to handle all of that. And all these churches can send to this church, the sponsoring church, that will then put on the work. Well, hasn't God given every church its job to do what it can to spread the gospel? Yeah. <coughs> that just seems so small. <coughs> compared to what we could do if we just pooled all our money and, and put it under the oversight of this church and let this church do big things. Well, this is the kind of chart that you'd see in those debates. A fellow would ask the question. He would say, well, can one church send money to another church for evangelism? You don't find that in the Bible. Oh, yeah, that'd be all right. Well, can 500? Can 5,000? How about all the churches? How about if all churches in the whole world all do their work through one church? <laughs> Anybody see a problem with that? That seems like that's a little far. Yeah, it sure is. 
But in principle, it's the same thing. Now, the point that's made here in 1 Peter 5 could not be more plain. That is that congregations set up by God, local churches are just that. They are independent, autonomous, local congregations. If our young folks get anything from this lesson, I hope that point is emphasized. Listen to me now. God did not set up churches of churches. God set up local congregations. That's the church that God works through. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, Barnabas and Paul appointed elders for them in each church. Paul wrote to Titus and he said, I want you to place men in authority over the churches in every town. Elders in every church. Self-governing, freestanding, independent of any other group for its existence and for its function. Just that simple. That's God's plan. Every church had its own work. Every church had its own treasury. Every church had its own leadership. Every church had its own corrective discipline. It's not our job to run somebody else's work or theirs to run this work. And yet today you'll find among brethren happily submitting to the idea that, well, this is the mother church over here and this is the church that they're going to be overseeing somewhere else. There's no more authority for a local church, one church, to run another, to oversee another, and its work, part of its work, all of its work, than there is for one church to run every church. There's no indication that an eldership ever scripturally ruled over more than the flock that is among them. If an eldership can assume the oversight of one additional congregation or one part of its work, it can assume all of the work of that church and it can assume the work of every church. So it's just a really great point to make in passing that Peter is describing for us elders in terms of a local work Local oversight. Now, let's, let's go back to 1 Peter 5 and notice again a couple of points that he makes concerning the motivation of these men. He says that they ought to take the oversight not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Um, the American Standard Version reads, not yet for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Not for unclean profit, but with a ready mind. Let it be something you want to do instead of something you merely do to make money. Do your work not for mere pay, but for, from a real desire to serve. What does this indicate to us? Well, one thing it indicates is there were some elders, obviously, who were supported financially for their work of teaching. And so that uh, is something, again, that is scriptural. You can have a man who, uh, whose work is teaching and who also can serve as a shepherd. That point is made here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, likewise. You remember the passage there where Paul says that a man uh, who serves in the teaching as well as in the eldership may be worthy of double honor. Uh, so it is scriptural for men to serve as teachers and to be supported for that as well as being elders. But as with any teacher, there is a big difference between paying a man so he can devote himself to preaching and study and paying him to preach. Uh, like a friend of mine used to say, if you can pay a fellow to preach, you can pay him not to preach. Or you can pay him to preach what you want him to preach. That kind of language, if it's true, is a disaster. He's paid to preach. Uh, it, it should not be that way. It must not be that way. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, it has been that way sometimes. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust will they heap to themselves teaching, having itching ears, and they'll be turned away from the truth and turned to fables. They'll just pile up a group of teachers. They pay them enough, they'll tell, say what they want them to say. God forbid. So, he says here, an elder certainly must not serve for some sort of financial reason. He serves rather out of a heart that is dedicated to God and he may be supported if the circumstances mandate. He goes on to say, they are not to be lords over God's heritage, but examples to the flock. They're not to be lords. You and I have heard this passage sometimes, I think, misused to suggest that what Peter, Peter is saying is, 
that uh, elders have no authority. They're just to be examples. That's not what this verse is teaching. When he says they're not to be lords, it does not undo every passage that talks about the authority of elders. The word here for Lord only used four times in the New Testament. Now, the, four, the, the root of this word is used many times, but this particular word is a rare word in the New Testament. To Lord against, that is to control, to subjugate, to exercise dominion over, lordship over, to, to lord over, to overcome. Uh, Vincent makes it plain. There are other words that the Holy Spirit uses to suggest uh, legitimate authority. But this word, he says, carries with it the idea of high-handed rule. You can't point to this verse and say, now here he's telling us that there is no authority in the eldership that they don't have rule. They certainly do. Other passages make that plain. But this is not a word that's used in a positive way ever. It's a word that suggests the idea of an abusive kind of effort to rule. The word for lording implies an authority exercised both wrongfully and oppressively. Ambition, the love of power for the sake of power, is, from the apostle's standpoint, as great a hindrance to true pastoral work as avarice. It is an abuse and it's condemned. Vine says, of the evil elders in lording it over the saints under their spiritual care. I like this quotation. Shepherds should not do their work as, or their job as lords because the sheep do not belong to them. The sheep are entrusted to them. That's a good thing for every one of us to remember, including preachers and elders and all the rest. The local church does not belong to us. The souls don't belong to us. And for elders who are given the care of these souls, they must not treat the church with ownership as if it was a business somehow that they owned and ran. And I might make this point as we pass from this, that um, I've heard this said, and I think it's true, if I am in a position of an elder and I'm looking to try to avoid being one of these lords, one of the things that will really help me is to be devoted to a true communication. Uh, that is not only talking but listening. I read an article, read a lot of articles about this subject, but uh, a number of years ago a brother wrote an article he entitled, Elders Must Communicate with the Church. He said, Elders must be good communicators. That is necessary in order to be apt to teach, to be able to exhort, and to convince the gainsayer. Um, he said, Some are especially gifted and given to public teaching and, and preaching, laboring in the word and in doctrine. Not only must an elder be sound in the faith, he must be effective or able to speak and teach clearly and effectively, but his leadership is not limited to public teaching. He says, if he is to pastor and oversee the church, he must be a leader of men with the ability to communicate clearly and effectively in setting goals and expressing mature judgments on a wide range of matters and generally giving direction, encouragement, and counsel. And he goes on to make this suggestion. He says, here are ways that elders want to keep avenues of communication open. Now, this is judgment, but I think his, his points are well to be considered. He said, number one, he said, I would have the elders make the announcements. He said, it, it, it makes them visible. Now, it's assuming these fellows are not preaching every week. But he said, you know, it, it, it makes them visible. It gives them a chance to exhort the church as well as to, to send messages along the line. People come to them with the announcements, so they're the first to be aware of what's going on. He said, he thought that was a good thing. In the second place, he said, they need to meet with the men. He suggested a quarterly basis. That's a judgment call. But he said, you need to meet with the men. You don't need to abolish meeting with the men because you have elders. Uh, he said, the elders will give reports and exhortations and then open the floor to suggestion and discussion. You got to talk, you got to listen. You have a plan, but you're willing to change the plan if you see that it's not going to be fitted best to what people are needing. He suggests uh, uh, you must cultivate communication in both directions, from the elders to the men, from the men to the elders, and so on. 
He said, thirdly, elders need to meet with each other. <laughs> the communication needs to be within the eldership. That you cannot have, you cannot have the idea of elders pulling in different directions. Elders need to meet with the deacons, and elders need to meet with the teachers. And his point is, if elders are meeting and listening, then they're certainly going to be uh, a much better position to avoid the idea of just domineering and writing out orders and dropping them out the window for people to pick up and obey. That doesn't work very well anywhere, and certainly not in the church of the Lord. Um, so you have 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12, give attention to those who are working among you, who are over you in the Lord. There's listening and talking, there's communication, there's awareness. Call for the elders of the church. Um, Acts 15 and verse 22 it seemed good to the apostles and elders and the whole church to choose out men of their company, to go down there to Jerusalem and make it plain, or to find out, rather, what it was those folks taught in reference to the circumcision. Give ear. They watch for your souls. Listening works both ways. Elders must communicate with the local church. Okay. Um, he said, not lords, but examples. Uh, the word example simply means a pattern. Someone who lays down a path worthy of imitation, an example worthy of imitation. The idea of do as I do and not as I say is sinful. It's no better than the Pharisees who taught high principles and put heavy burdens on people and then didn't live them themselves. People can spot a phony and the eldership is doomed when a congregation recognizes that they are a say but not do group. Um, the passage does not teach that elders are without authority, but it does teach that they must live consistent with what they preach and that they must communicate with those around them. That's a good point. I wish we had more time, but uh, our time is, is running out. Let me go back one more time to Ephesians, uh, to, to 1 Peter 5. Not by constraint, but willingly. That's how he started. Not by constraint, but willingly. What does he mean by that? Constraint is just the idea of doing something by force, compelling someone to do something. Uh, not forced to do it. A man cannot be forced into the eldership, but that's right. Uh, the CEV, which is more of a commentary, reads, Just as shepherds watch over their sheep, you must watch over everyone God has placed in your care. Do it willingly in order to please God and not simply because, excuse me, you think that you must. When we talk about how an elder must not be compelled, does that mean that a man uh, is, is somehow disqualified from the job because he might be anxious about doing the job? I certainly hope not. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 gives the first qualification of an elder. He must be a man who desires the office. Well, does that mean he has to campaign for the office or that he has to uh, have a spirit that says, I will, uh, I, I, this is a job made for me? Does he, well, he certainly would suggest that he certainly can't be taken by force and forced into the office. That is true. Is there no place for any reluctance or any pause or any consideration? Um, I think about King Saul in reference to that. Maybe you do too. We all know that story. We don't have time to go back and tell it. But uh, when God chose the first king of Israel, he chose in some ways a rather unlikely candidate. And he thought so himself. And uh, when he chose Saul uh, and anointed him and let him know that he was the next king of Israel, he wasn't looking for the job of king. He was looking for donkeys. And uh, he wound up going to uh, Samuel to try to find some help with his donkey problem. And he wound up being anointed king of Israel. And you remember how the text says that when he got back to, to uh, his home, his uncle asked him how it went. He told him, well, we had to go to Samuel. What did Samuel say to you? He said the donkeys were found. He left out that part about being anointed king. And, uh, you know, it was uh, Samuel who brought Saul in called him the desire of Israel. We're here to choose a king. And he has the people go before him and the tribe of Benjamin before him. And Saul is the one, and where is Saul? He's hiding among the baggage. And we might say, well, that's terrible. What should he have done? 
Should he have said, well, this is about time. I was waiting on you guys to come and make me king. Where's my office? I got some people I want to fire today. I got some plans. Would that have been better? God didn't think so. In fact, over in chapter 15, by this time, Saul has made a mess of things. And uh, God, through Samuel, told him, he said, you know, when you were little in your own eyes, you were useful to me. God didn't think that bashfulness or that backwardness or that hesitation was a terrible thing. He had to be a leader, and he was a leader. But if he'd have kept some of that humility, it might have helped him lead a lot better. I'm sure it would have. I think the same thing is true about people today. Uh, there's some humble reluctance that's not at all, I think, out of line with what this office demands. After all, the sheep we're looking over are pretty expensive. Uh, I, I'll close with this. You know, um, I don't know if you recognize this fellow or not. This is Double Diamond. Double Diamond the sheep. Double Diamond is a textile sheep. I didn't know what a textile sheep was. So I got to look in. This is from a British newspaper, so it must be true. But anyway, Double Diamond uh, is the most expensive ram in the world. He recently, just this summer, was auctioned off for a price tag somewhere around a half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Now, they're not all that expensive. Uh, but for breeding purposes, he was thought to be that valuable. But the article did tell me that it's not unusual for these textile sheep to be sold with a five-figure price tag, according to the Textile Sheep Society. How about that? I'm not a member, but there, there they are, and they would know. And I think, and then they went on to say in the article that uh, they are highly prized for their muscular build, and they produce a high-quality lean meat. And I thought, who in the world would eat a $10,000 sheep what are you talking about? I don't know. There's a lot about this story. I don't know. Anyway, I got old Double Diamond there, and he's worth a half a mil. And I couldn't help but think, suppose that somebody brought old Double Diamond over to my place and said, well, I see you got a fence there. Why, why don't you do me a favor? Look, I'm going to be gone for, well, I don't really know how long I'm going to be gone. But I need you to watch old Double Diamond for me. That'd be all right? I said, well... I'd have to say I wouldn't immediately agree to that because I don't think I could replace him if some of the neighborhood dog got to him. In fact, I, I, you could sell me three times and you wouldn't get that kind of money. Uh, so be a little hesitation, even if I like the guy and want to help him out. Now, the point is, obviously, you know, somebody says, well, listen, why don't you just be one of the shepherds of God's people? God's people are worth a whole lot more than that sheep is right there. A whole lot more. And I think a man who thinks too lightly of that responsibility is probably not fit for the job. But I want to emphasize this point as we close. I still say that if a man meets the qualities, he absolutely should say yes. Now he may know in his heart for reasons that are clear to him and maybe to others, he's not qualified. Whenever a local congregation is looking for elders, almost always, not always, but almost always, some people will be put forward that are obviously not qualified, and they know it. Don't just jump in there and say, oh, yeah, I'll give it a whirl. I'm probably not ready, but I'll give it. No. But the work's too important. But a man knows in his heart there's nothing really hindering him except his own fear. Then let him move forward with a motive in mind that this work is important and it needs to be done. Um, and I'll tell you something else. When the chief shepherd shall appear, then he'll receive a crown of life, a crown of glory that will not fade away. That's a good reason to say yes to this very daunting offer. Back in the first chapter of 1 Peter, uh, no, the third chapter of 1 Peter, I'm sorry. Earlier in this same letter, Peter writes, and he says to us that uh, there is a, a glory that awaits those who are willing to serve. I meant... Uh, First chapter, 
And verse 3, there is a living hope awaiting us, verse 3, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. <coughs> and so Peter calls us to a hope um, in the second chapter in verse 12 there will be some who will be critics but he said I'll tell you what they'll do they'll have to notice that God in the day of his visitation that God indeed blesses you and the promise here is that one day the chief shepherd will say to you well done well done because you've done the hard work the important work and you've done it to the best of your ability Wish we had more time tonight. We'd, we'd go into to Matthew chapter 25. You remember that story well. And here were fellows who were given talents, amounts of money. And those amounts of money represent, I think, uh, opportunities. Different abilities, different opportunities, but the same expectation. Take what God has given you and use it to his glory to the fullest. And there was one fellow who hid it because he was afraid. He was condemned not because he had less than the others, it was because he did nothing. He made the greatest mistake you can make, being so afraid of making a mistake that you do nothing. The promise is that for those who uh, work for God now, that prepares them for work in the world to come. That, I think, is the point that he makes in the passage. And for those who do nothing now and who shirk and fail now, the glorious work that was intended for you, somebody else will do it. But for you, there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a serious matter. And one that I hope we take the right attitude toward. Those who shirk the service of God now, the things that they can do, close the open doors, they're going to be lost eternally. That's a sober thought. Heaven will surely be worth it all. The Lord calls us to serve. There's a great quote from John Wesley you probably heard uh, before, quoted, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can and all the times you can to all the people you can as long as you ever can. Take the work that you have a chance to do and do that with all your might to his glory. One fellow said it this way, do the hard thing. And if we do that, and hold to him, we won't be sorry. I appreciate your kind attention. Please get out your songbooks. Please turn to the number that's been selected. We're talking tonight about a specific work, the work of shepherding. It's a work that I believe some folks in this room will one day take up. And I don't want you to be afraid of it. I want you to prepare for it, and I want you to be ready for it. And I want you to, to, to execute it prayerfully every day recognizing the great charge that's been given to you. But I'll tell you, that work must begin with the first decision we have to serve Christ. <laughs> to say that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I need the blood of Jesus and I believe he's the son of God and I'll confess his name and I come in repentance and I need to be baptized. I need to be buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Maybe that's your desire tonight. Maybe you're here as one who is a child of God and has done that, and yet you've not been faithful to the Lord you promised to be faithful to. Tonight, make that right with him. Somehow, if we can help you in any way, let us know, please, right now, while we stand.